everyone. My name is Diana Lindsay, and I am president of Sunbelt Publications, and welcome to another Sunbelt Spotlight. Our Spotlight series focuses on our authors and their books and their expertise on subject matters that are within their books. And we're just delighted today and honored to have as our special guest, Michael Connolly Misquish. He's a member of the uh, Campo Kumeyaay Nation. And I'd like to just kind of say a few words a little bit about his background so you can be impressed like I am about all that he has done uh, to serve his people. In 1990, he established and directed one of the first tribal environmental protection agencies in the United States. His work on issues of taxation policy and uh, impediments to sustainable tribal economies is nationally recognized. He's authored many papers on tribal history, economics, and resource management, and he has published books on Kumeyaay history and cosmology. Michael uh, has a Bachelor of Science degree in Manufacturing Engineering and a Master of Arts in Economics. He's an adjunct professor at San Diego State University, and he has served his uh, uh, Campo Kumeyaay Nation for 17 years as an elected officer. Um, I, what I'd like to do first to start off before I introduce him is kind of show you the book that uh, that he has written that is featured today. It is my Uyao. I hope I said that closely <laughs> to what it is in Kumeyaay. It's uh, Kumeyaay cosmology. And if you're watching today, and if you go on our website. Uh, you will see that this book is discounted for everybody that is watching. It's normally $12.95. You can get this book for $9.95 if you're interested in getting a copy of it. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Michael Connolly Misquich, and he will be doing a slide presentation. And uh, afterwards, if we have time, we'll take questions. Please look uh, below. You'll see a chat box. If you have specific questions that you would like Michael to uh, respond to, uh, please uh, enter those questions in the chat box. Michael, welcome to Sunbelt Spotlight, and I'm looking forward to hearing your speech. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Hauka memu kemenue, which you he Michael Connolly misquish. Um, you know, as Diana said, I'm Michael Connolly misquish. I'm from the Campo Band of the Kumeyaay Nation. My uh, my clan or Shamul is Misquish. The um, uh, I'm going to load my PowerPoint now, so give me one second here. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, can you see me too? Yes. Or just the slides? Both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm seeing a lot different from what you guys are, so <laughs> just want to make sure. All right. Um, well, my presentation today is my Uyao, and my is the sky or above, and Uyao is our word for knowledge or knowing. So it's really sky knowing is the literal translation of my Uyao. So this is um, Kumeyaay cosmology. It's 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 the result of um, about thirty years of of uh, of work that I've done. Um, a lot of it goes back uh, into the early 90s and some of my work with um, uh, environmental impact reports and environmental impact statements and doing a lot of work on in the environmental field with uh, with my tribe and with other tribes and uh, other Kumeyaay bands and and uh, and there was a lot of uh, not a lot of knowledge that came to me from from other people that I I spoke with there were uh, ethnography reports that uh, that had a lot of uh, little bits and pieces. There were stories regarding our songs that were also uh, uh, related to, to cosmology. And so over the years, I, I pieced together a lot of these and, and eventually was able to put it into, into a book. The For those of you who aren't familiar with us, the, um, uh, let's see here. Um, the Kumeyaay Nation is a is uh, a binational tribe. We we go from uh, down past Ensenada to the south, up into northern San Diego County, and out into the desert. 
Uh, at various times in our history, we've had we've had some populations who've lived with the Quichon uh, all the way to the Colorado River, and and others that live with the Cocopa at, down at the Hardy River in the uh, in the Delta area of the of the Colorado. Um, so we've had some really close relationships with them. We've um, also had had uh, in more recent times have had populations that live with the Pai Pai, who are the tribe just to the south of us in in Baja, California. The white areas that you see on your screen are the current reservations in the United States and the and the um, indigenous ejidos in Mexico. So it's their version of reservations. So when we talk about astronomy, uh, we really it's hard to talk about astronomy without talking about all of of the interrelationships that cosmology had at one time with our people it was it, it was so integrated in in into our life ways into our relationship that we had with nature um, with the plants and animals with uh, the way that we manage the environment uh, burning was a was a very significant part of our environmental controls when you burn how you burn um, it is important because it's part of creating the fire mosaic that was a big part of increasing the carrying capacity of the ecosystem. And so burning had to be done in, in a certain way in certain times. When you moved your camps, and, and we had permanent villages in, in the lower elevations, but we also had seasonal camps where we'd go up the drainages and, um, and harvest different resources. So knowing when to move your camp was, uh, was very important because you didn't want to arrive too soon at the next place um, where the food wouldn't be ready for you to harvest or you wouldn't want to arrive too late where all the animals have grabbed everything and there's nothing left for the people. So, so, the, um, so knowing when, when to move was tied to a, different things. One of them was astronomy. The, uh, another was, was no, looking at the, the migration of, of animals. Another was looking at plants. Um, you have indicator plants at lower elevations that would tell you when one plant is, is blooming or or is um, uh, giving fruit or, or, or um, in another state of its development, it, it would tell you that, that that means that there's a different plant at a higher elevation that's also gonna be going through that at maybe in, you know, in a few weeks or a couple months from that, that time. So there's the, uh, all of these things were blended together in determining when you're gonna move your village up to another location. That's a lot of work doing that. So you wanna make sure that you're doing it at the right time. Ceremonies were very important, and we had ceremonies for the equinoxes and for the solstices, and we had a lot of ceremonies in between. We now, because of, of uh, modern astronomy and our modern calendars, we tend to, to put things right exactly on the equinox or the solstice, but a long time ago, the, they, would, uh, they would be more like, likely to be either the new moon or the full moon following the, say, the autumn equinox. So, so the calendar would also be used in conjunction with the, with the current status of the moon. Um, hunting, when the game is gonna be moving through an area, uh, different ways to, to hunt it. When, so you know, um, you know, if you're gonna uh, uh, try to ambush some, you know, some uh, mountain sheep that are passing through, or, or you know when the bears are going to be coming through, you want to avoid them. Uh, all of that is tied to the calendar and knowing when, when you can go to different places. Navigation, of course, is really uh, uh, pretty universal as far as, as, as cosmology in, in many, many cultures. And of course, it was used for us too. Um, you know, being able to navigate, knowing which way is north and which way is, you know, the, all the cardinal directions and being able to use that as part of your traveling. And then there was a part that, that was uh, similar to what we call astrology now, or the, the looking at, at, uh, at your life, the life expectancy, successes, failures, are there bad signs in the sky, are there things that are going to influence what happens to you here on, here on earth, and, and all of those were interrelated with the with the cosmology. So when we look at the universe, the, the, the world that we're on is the, is the middle world, there's an underworld, and, a, and then there's an outer world. So it's like three shells that, that, it, that are part of existence. And this was used in sand paintings. And th this particular sand painting is, is from the Luiseno, who had a very similar 
religious belief to to us and, and as far as the nature of the universe and um and the break in in this sand painting there was a break within the circles and that represented the portals between the worlds so there are places where the the um the ability to acquire spiritual energy or spiritual power where it's easier for a person to get it. And those are sacred places where you can go and fast and sing and you can help to draw in that energy that you can use for, for whatever purposes you're trying to use them in the world. So there are places both that have connections into the underworld and places to the to the outer world. The the black dot in the center represented a, a, um, a, a kind of a new concept that um uh that was a, a place of nothingness that uh it, it wasn't in some of our earlier beliefs but it, it came to be a um a type of uh not a hell in the in the christian sense but uh if you didn't live the proper life on this world when you died your spirit rather than moving on into the next world your spirit would just cease to exist and just fade into nothingness and so the black dot represented that nothingness it's really important to look at the at the cycles in the sky and it was you know if you can imagine back in, during those days the um the sky is half the world and nowadays you don't see that and unless you live in a in a rural area and i, I live up in campo and and even here we have a lot of light pollution and uh you, you can't always experience that that um that sense of the sky as being half of your world but when you know if you get out into a good reason to go out to to utah or up in the rockies and or up in the sierras and really get a good view of the sky and then just imagine um you know people two three hundred years ago uh looking up there and, and the sky was a part of you as a part of your life because it's it takes up so much of your existence and and how the sky moves was so dependable it was it 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 had these um uh, these very set cycles and and understanding those cycles and celebrating those cycles were a part of the ceremonies that people would do and there was a there, there was the belief that if they didn't do that that the cycles could be disrupted so knowing what what and when to do particular ceremonies was really important and um the, there were planets in the sky, and planets uh, they had different uh, different cycles. They they weren't um, they weren't as easy to predict as uh, as the motion of the stars, but they did follow a very set path on the what they call the plane of the ecliptic, or the the path um, where the sun travels during the daytime is the same path that the planets would follow during the nighttime. So they were in that plane of the ecliptic. Um, they were seen as, as sky people that were watching the activities of people on, on earth and making sure that they're following the correct path. They could intervene. They could cause uh, bad things to happen to you if you, were, if you weren't following the proper path. Um, some of the phenomenon like the, the eight-year cycle of Venus was understood. And, and uh, so that really took a lot of, of observations in the sky over long periods of time over and over again that people knew hey the venus gets uh gets brighter and dimmer over these eight year cycles the sun the sky the north star and the moon all were were part of these um, entities within the sky that would watch the conduct of people and could bring punishment disease or injury so um and i'll talk a little more about the the different constellations the moon was also really important um, the waxing and waning of the moon, and and uh, and and this is something that that is, um, uh, you also see in other cultures in in uh, in Asia and Europe, the um, uh, I, probably in Africa too. Uh, the the uh, uh, a lot of harvests were done to the moon. That harvesting certain plants while the moon was waxing made them more potent. Uh, other others you harvested uh, more in the waning moon. It was usually I think it was the the medicinal plants that were above ground was was uh, I believe it was the waxing and then the, the below ground medicines were for the waning moon so so all of that was that, that was incorporated into the cycles of the moon and because women um, their menstrual cycles followed the also followed the the 28 day 
um, days of the lunar month, then the moon was considered to have a special special effects uh, on women. Eclipses, uh, the uh, Hiliawasau and Inyawasau are um, uh, literally means nibbles at the moon or nibbles at the sun, and they were the eclipses. Uh, for some tribes, the eclipses were times um, where where you wanted to stay out of, you didn't want to be under the sky during an eclipse, and you go and go undercover. Um, for us, it was we would uh, uh, basically. Uh, challenge the sky and you make a lot of noise kind of like new year's and people bang pots and pans so we we would go and make a lot of noise when there was an eclipse uh kind of proclaiming our presence and uh but it was considered bad for pregnant women to be under the eclipse so they they were supposed to go under shelter comets uh as i said earlier the the cycles are really important in this this uh, rep repetition that you see in the skies and the way the seasons come and the uh, the you know the, the marking the four uh, um, periods in in uh, in the cosmos the equinox and the solstices and um, and the the appearance of a comet was something that was really not predictable and so um, and of course now we know that some of the comets we can predict them but uh, a long time ago when a comet would come it'd be something that would hang in the sky for many days at a time. It could be in any part of the sky. It didn't follow follow any particular path, and um, and that was something to, that was a, a a sign of that that there could be a lot of misfortune coming. And it was a, a, a something to be really fearful of when you'd see the comet hanging in the sky. Um, the meteors, even though they weren't really predictable, they they. They're so common; they weren't really considered uh, anything bad. And and there there are some um, some stories of the the great snake uh, Mithawiat, who who um, uh, is a big part of our creation stories. And the uh, one of the stories when he got burned, the the sparks that flew from his body brought knowledge and brought songs to to people and in language and different languages to to people. And um, and one of the the stories is that those sparks continue to fall to earth and that's what we see when we see a meteor uh there's also another story that i i've um heard about that that they were new souls coming from the heavens but i don't know if that that might be a little european uh, um, uh, cultural pollution there that uh, got integrated into our into our stories so I haven't seen any other references or anything to substantiate that. Um, so the sky, the sky was our was our iPad. It was uh, our way. You know, no matter where you traveled, no matter what you had to carry, uh, you always had your reference up there in the sky. So it wasn't just to use it as a clock. And you, or use it as a calendar to determine when to do things or when to move, or just or to navigate. But the but the constellations themselves told stories. They were a mnemonic device that uh, that where people could look at the different constellations and it would uh, they could tie them into different stories. And so these these stories then were integrated also um, into some, our ceremonies and. In our puberty ceremonies is one of the places where sand paintings were done, and um, and these were some sketches from an ethnographer of, of a couple of our sand paintings. So um, the constellations were were part of that, and the the one on the left there, you can see that that white bar across the middle was representative of the Milky Way, and so they they have the and down at the bottom is the Pleiades in the lower right, and so you see the the crescent moon and um, and on the right hand side, you can see Emu, the three stars in Orion's belt, and uh, I'm not sure about some of the other ones, and a lot of snakes in our constellations too, so um, I'll talk some more about those. This was a, a recreation that was done at the Museum of Man, which is now the Museum of Us, and I think they still have it on display. So the sand paintings incorporated these um, these lessons from the sky so 
uh, lessons that would that, that they would use in instructing people when they're going through the puberty ceremony about how they were to conduct themselves in in life, how they're supposed to treat others, and um, where where they needed to observe the proper um, uh, the proper ceremonies. And and I, I've heard some of our some of our collectors, uh, people who still uh, harvest a lot of the the traditional kumiyad plants, they 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 refer to it as uh, um, that ceremony wasn't something that you just did at a certain time, but ceremony was was everywhere. Ceremony was life. Ceremony was part of how you harvested and how you lived your life. So so really, in, in a sense, there your whole life was part of this ceremony. Um, the Milky Way was the path into into the next life. Uh, it's called uh, my hut for Kukur, the the spine of the sky. The uh, racer snakes represented, they were usually drawn in black and red, and it represented the masculine and feminine forces of the world. Um, red and black can also represent the, the spiritual world and the physical world. So red and black were really important colors in, in looking at the balance of forces in the world. So we have, we have the, the, the cosmological cycles and, and how important that was to, to, um, to that these cycles were um, were continuing on and 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 the uh, but the other side of it the other part of it of the world too uh, other than the cycles was the balance of forces so the balance of masculine and feminine masculine and feminine the balance of spiritual and the physical dances were also incorporated in with the stars and and these were a couple dances where they would use uh, the constellations as a part of the part of their dancing. Uh, that's actually a Luis Senio dance on the right hand side where they were in the configuration of the Milky Way and they were dancing around the around the center point. And um, the dancer at the left has a red and black staff that he's using in, in, uh, in his dance. So to do these observations, of course, uh, a lot of places are just natural observatories and, and you can line up uh, to a peak uh, or be on one mountain and look at another mountain and you know the sun will come up uh, on the equinox or the solstice will come right up over the other peak. But there's also places where we actually created physical, um, physical uh, uh, stations to, to, to look at observatories to look at the, at the stars. And, uh, this is one out in Akatillo. There's a, a they call it the the wheel, um, and uh, you can see how the spokes on the wheel line up with the uh, the solstice and equinox. The the east uh, winter solstice spike is actually off about uh, about 15 to 17 degrees from the the true winter solstice, but it does line up uh, very closely with um, uh, with Emu, the, the three mountain sheep. So it's, uh, so the observatory, uh, I think some of the spokes may have been more to align with the, um, uh, with the constellations that come up at night rather than with the sun coming up uh, in the morning. And, and that makes, a, makes sense too, when you think of winter time, that's usually overcast in the, um, in the sky, so when you're looking for your um, your markers, uh, especially in, in the morning before the um, uh, the overcast is burned off, uh, it's probably easier to look for the constellations at, at night rather than the morning. This is uh, this has been there are pictures from the past where spokes have disappeared and reappeared, so there has been some um, uh, some meddling with this, and and so. It's hard to tell exactly, uh, you know, if, if things have shifted a little from where they were, but they do line up pretty closely as it is. There's also Cairn markers that we, we see where they align up with uh, equinox or solstices. Uh, this is over by Hakumba, and you can see the circle. And I don't know if, can you see my, uh, yeah, okay that you can see the circle there and then there's a cross in the center. And this is up in uh, Table Mountain out by Hakumba. Uh, this is one of our, our greatest observatory areas. And 
Uh, it's by La Rumorosa. It's just south of the border. Um, uh, I don't know, about 20 miles east of Tecate. And uh, the, the sun comes in and it shines down in, in, in through this, uh, this overhang here. And, and you can see on the right, it signs, as it shines in, there's this light dagger that comes through. And the light dagger, it skips over this figure and lights it up and then it kind of comes back and intersects with his head. And this is on December 21st or 22nd, which um, whenever the solstice is that particular year. And the, uh, the Mexicans called it uh, the little devil, El Diablito, but uh, I, I think it's probably more of a uh, representation of, of the um, sun spirit, uh, but it's, uh, don't know for sure. This, this here, and these are also in La Rumorosa, what you see in this upper left slide is a basin. And the light on December 21st frames the basin. And so it looks like that could have been maybe for some type of ceremonial purpose that something was prepared uh, in that basin. There's also, uh, this, this is a, um, a, a natural uh, solstice marker here that during, on, December 21st during the solstice, the light shines through this opening and out onto this big flat area here. So this may have been a, a dance site. On Viejas Mountain, there was a, um, a cross that was up on the peak that aligned with the solstice. And um, you can see from the Viejas Peak the, at, the, um, at the solstice, the sun coming up over that that peak up in the lagunas. Uh, it's gone now. It's been uh, vandalized. There used to be also fire ceremonies that were done up there on, on Viejas up, up until I think it was the 19, at least 1970s. I don't know if it went into the 1980s. So Cal's Mountain uh, had, this was a circle with a, with a line in the center kind of like a Greek letter theta. Um, the, it, um, uh, it's kind of messed up a little bit here, but it actually got completely destroyed. Um, the, um, uh, unfortunately, and, and it wasn't their fault, uh, but there were some Boy Scouts that were doing uh, trail maintenance there on going up Cowles Mountain and they, they thought these were uh, rubble and they just got, picked all the rocks up and got kind of threw them off to the side and so, uh, that's gone now off Cal's, but there still are a lot of people that go to Cal's Mountain at the solstice. So a lot of a lot of non-Indians go there uh, because you have this this view where the sun's coming up right by this peak up on the horizon. In Dehisa, uh, I was uh, uh, told about this marker, and I went and checked it out, and and it it lines up on the equinox with a, with some rocks up on the hillside. And what's neat about this, this, this rock is, is very heavy. It's, uh, uh, it stands about five feet tall, and, but it, uh, it looks like it was rocked into position. So I can actually make it move a little bit. So you could, um, a couple people could actually, you know, rock it back and forth like an egg kind of, and, and, uh, and it looks like it was rocked down from about 20 feet away into the position that it's at. And this is over in Dulzura, and um, this rock here was broken off of this rock here on the on the other side of it. And the tip of this rock here lines up with uh, Takati Peak, which we call Kuchima, and it was one of our sacred mountains. And the um, on December twenty first, the sun comes up right right in that spot there. And the I was there for. Uh, for a solstice, and unfortunately, it was overcast. Wouldn't you know it? Uh, when when I wanted to, I wanted to catch the picture right when it was uh, right over the peak, and so you can see the sun here at the top. So I, I had to catch it a little bit later, and uh, when it got to the top of the rock, um, the hand is the are the stars in the constellation Leo, and uh, 
the uh, this here is is a really interesting uh, um, uh, configuration of the of the constellation Cassiopeia, and when it was discovered, the um, uh, the ethnographer was who was uh, researching it found uh, I think it was about five of the holes, and and he he thought, well, you know, this is uh, this is interesting, and he went back and and he he thought it might be a constellation, so he um, he checked different constellations, and he found that that the stars did line up with Cassiopeia, but they, it was missing some of the some of the stars. So he went back to the site, and there was moss all covering the rock, and so he he scraped away at the places where there should be holes, and sure enough, he found them. They were underneath the moss. And so he was able to, to fill it out and, and, and determine that it was the entire Cassiopeia constellation. We have also large scale geoglyphs in, in different parts uh, of our territory. Most of them have been damaged or destroyed over time. This one here, uh, was there were a lot of these geometric patterns. I don't know how many of them uh, uh, correspond to constellations. Some of them are probably related to our creation stories. There's um, there are stories of the great snake Matawiak um, when he uh, when he came to people out. He he was asked to come to the people out in the desert, and when he went there, he um, he built a house for him, uh, and Wa is what we call it, and and the um, when the, when he got there, he was so huge that the people said, "Oh, you're, you're not going to fit in this house." And and he said, "Oh, yeah, I can do it." And he and so he went into the house and he spiraled in on himself and kept spiraling in on himself until they got his whole body within the house. And uh, and so I think that's why you see spirals a lot in in a lot of our rock art. Uh, there's also one of the forms that he could take was uh, Matawiyat was he could actually fly. And in the flying snake form, his body would be made of butterflies, and he would he would fly in a kind of a spiral pattern in it, or corkscrew kind of kind of pattern, and um, and and I think that's also part of uh, what you see in some of the representations. The this was um, was destroyed. The 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 BLM wanted to preserve it, and they put a fence around it, and the off roaders got mad at the area being uh, being excluded from this area. So they cut the fence down and they went in with their uh, with their off road vehicles and they did spirals in here until they completely destroyed all of the geoglyphs. So um, so the BLM went and they, they put the fence back up and they and they were able to go in and recreate it. So this is actually a recreation. They had enough aerial photogra photographs. They were able to to recreate the designs that were there originally. So this isn't the original designs. So these are the constellations. Let's see. I I don't have time to really go a lot into this, but just some of the some of the constellations and and what we know about the uh, th there's a lot of stories that that have been lost to time, uh, but we do know a little bit about some of these. Emu was probably the most important uh, constellation. We'd have our fire ceremonies at the Winter solstice, Emu is the three mountain sheep. They're the three stars in Orion's belt. Um, and they come up right after sunset on December 21st. The, um, uh, the raven is associated with, with death. Uh, the, and, and you can see within these constellations, I drew the European constellation too. So um, uh, Aquila is, is, is inside the raven body and then and here, Virgo, uh, you can see the pattern of Virgo inside the, the picture of the buzzard and Sha'i. Um, Hut the Paw, Coyote, you know, we, we have all kinds of stories that even to this day of Coyote. So Coyote is a good, uh, teaches us lessons about the things not to do in life. Although occasionally Coyote does do the right thing, but uh, not very often. And, uh, and usually he's, he's just like the Coyote and Roadrunner. Things backfire on him all the time. Uh, Shaluk is the lightning. And um, it's also, it, it's the constellation Scorpio, but but if you look at the top, the bow uh, of, of stars in the top of Scorpio, um, and then the stars coming back here, it's almost like a bow and arrow. And one of the, um, 
one of the references I ran across was that that, that some some of the um, uh, Kumeyaay bands would call called Scorpio the shooter constellation, and um, there was a um, a character in our in our, uh, in our stories the the grandson of of the first woman who um, uh, his name was Kuya Homar, and uh, and her name was Sinyo Hao. And Kuya Homar, had, he was kind of like a superhero kind of guy, and he he was the wonder working boy, and and he could actually fire uh, lightning bolts from his bow. So uh, so the shooter constellation, uh, the shaluk means lightning, and and the shooter may have been a a, a version of the of that lightning because of the shooting uh, shooting of those lightning bolts. Uh, rattlesnake is really uh, prevalent in a lot of stories, and in um, in our Shaluk songs, the rattlesnake has has a big part. Uh, it also uh, he was involved when in the first death that occurred. Um, Nimush, the bear, um, uh, the bear. It's interesting because you know, as as human beings, you know, we we tend to think of ourselves as the as the culmination of everything. But uh, uh, the uh, the bear was actually who the creator wanted first to to be the the recipient of knowledge. And and uh, but the bear was just uh, was so grumpy all the time and not willing to you know it didn't work well with others. And and so then uh, uh, we were the second pick, and so we uh, we got the knowledge. And uh, the tarantula is, uh, it's a punisher, but he's also a protector. And we use the, the tarantula could actually be used as a charm to protect you against uh, somebody trying to do some, uh, some bad magic on you. And, um, you know, if you carried a tarantula, especially if you carried a live tarantula, that would, uh, uh, that'd be a protection. But even, even a dead tarantula body could, could, be, um, could be a charm that would protect you. And a long time ago, well, maybe even today, I don't know, uh, that in our, um, our gambling games, the Payon games, the uh, people, a lot of people would carry charms and, and uh, talismans, things, uh, crystals and, and uh, tarantulas and, and other stones and things that, that, that they felt had, had a power that, that would help them to win when because it's a big gambling game there. So I kind of wonder if that carries over. Maybe some of them are using it on the slot machines and you know, kind of grabbing their tarantula in their pocket when they're <laughs> when they're crystal when they're ready to you know push the button on the slot machine. But anyway, it, it was used uh, like that. Or or if you really were fearful that somebody was trying to do something really bad to you and you wanted that protection, then then the tarantula body was part of that. Um, the racer snake, as I said before, that was the red form and the black form of the racer snake were really significant in, in uh, representing the, the forces of, of male and female. The, the Big Dipper is, you know, we're all familiar with that as far as pointing out where the North Star is and, and also uh, giving us the, um, a, a clock at night. Um, the cross in, you know, the cross was something that was uh, in rock art and in baskets before Christianity. So uh, it was a symbol for us, uh, represented the, the spiritual path of your death where you collect your shadows, where you go to the north, the east, the west, and then finally you go on a long journey to the south to, to a mountain that, that connects into Mahitakur and the, the Milky Way. Um, Isoch, the, the hand is a uh, constellation Leo, and, uh, that, and it marks the fall equinox. So we have the stories on the wolf, uh, the the uh, Pleiades, and uh, the Hyades were important, but more for the uh, agricultural kumiai as one of the indicators of when it was time to to plant. So uh, they, we call them kamya, or they call themselves kamya. Um, the uh, gopher snake, garter snake are represented, and nyami is the um, uh, is where we get one of our uh, one of our practices when when somebody uh, close to us passes away we'll we'll cut our hair and as a sign of mourning and uh, and that goes back to to when the the great snake um, myha wit was was burned and and yemi was uh, the wildcat had so much grief that that he cut his tail in mourning and that's why he has the short tail and th this was uh 
this is a calendar I put together that, uh, you know, our calendar, like I said before, it didn't go exactly on the solstice and equinox. It, it might be the full moon or the new moon following the equinox or solstice uh, where the actual ceremonies would occur that would mark it. Um, so, uh, so it depended on, on that. And, uh, and also our months were flexible. So you might have a real long dry season or you might have a month of a whole lot of rain. That, and and so, um, so that month might go a lot longer or a lot shorter. And, um, and we generally, it was, it was pretty much accepted that we had six months, but there were some people who said that you repeat the months coming back um, after the first half of the year. So, uh, so what I did was I took the, the, the traditional discussions, which had a lot of, a lot of variation and, uh, and put them into a Western calendar so that we have a rigid 12 month calendar that starts right on the solstices and the equinoxes, but, but it, it kind of combines um, uh, what we use nowadays with what, what we used in the past. So you see the seasons and th this starts at the, at the fall equinox, September 21st. That was the start of our year uh, with the acorn harvest season went from September 21st to November 21st, Clea Amul, and it's a two month season. And then you have the, the different uh, months there uh, going as you go clockwise and you start with the fall, it's Kupi Hau, uh, and you can read those on the outside of the circles. And I just put the three, the Emu constellation in the middle, just, just uh, out of artistic license. So the Milky Way is our path into the next life. And when you burn tobacco smoke, that helps to carry that, the soul of the person into the next life. So you didn't want people hanging around here on earth. So when they died, you wanted their spirit to move on. And um, it, it could be bad for somebody to stay here if you were, especially if you were really close to somebody. So we, we had uh, uh, restrictions, like if somebody real close to you passed away, you weren't supposed to eat salt or eat meat because the, uh, their spirit could enter your body through that salt or meat. Salt is like blood and then meat is like flesh. So they, or is flesh. And, they, and, and so this, their spirit could try to enter that and get into you to try to pull you with them they didn't want to go to the next life by themselves so if they're really close to you they want you to go with them and uh, that's why you know when people die uh, sometimes the, the, if there's somebody who's really close to them they'll pass away very soon very shortly after uh, because that spirit is drawing them and wanting to, to take them with them into the next world so you want them to to move on um, and so tobacco smoke is a way to help carry them up into the heavens and we would also burn sage Sage is more of a repellent, uh, so it, it was a way to smudge yourself and smudge your house. So that um, uh, actually, a long time ago, we used to burn our houses when when somebody passed away. But the uh, more modern times, we don't do that. So we use uh, sage as a way to to ensure that that spirit moves on into the next world. There was also, uh, and, and this is a terrible picture, but <laughs> the uh, the the split owl feather headdress. Uh, was representative of the negative uh, of the constellation. So, so um, when you look up in the sky and you see see the dark areas of the sky, those also had significance. And and I haven't been able to find out what that significance was. Other the, the only reference I found was the was to the uh, um, that, that they were represented as as part of the owl feather headdress. And I'll finish up here with uh, just a little discussion on the moon. Uh, Helshal is our word for moon. And in the European frame of reference, the, uh, or most of Europe, it, the, uh, what you see, what was brought into the, into the Americas was the, the idea of the man in the moon. And if you squint the right way, when you look at the moon, you kind of get that picture to the right. You can kind of, you can kind of see where the shadows line up there and you get the face in the moon. But when you go all around the world, the um, that's not the the what most people see and from culture after culture throughout the Americas in Asia India Africa what you find the most common thing that's seen in, in the moon is the rabbit and uh, in East Asia the rabbit is grinding medicine or food I kind of think that would be more like uh, probably what ours ours would be grinding acorns I think uh, 
the uh, the Aztec moot rabbit was uh, there, there's a whole story behind the the Creator Brothers and how uh, you know uh, how the rabbit uh, impression got got put into the moon by uh, by one of the the Creator gods uh, Buddhist the selfless rabbit so so there's these different rabbit uh, uh, interpretations of, of the moon that you see all over the world probably one of the most universal things that, that you find in cosmology and it's throughout the Americas through North and South America not all of, not all tribal cultures have it but but it is uh, very widespread and our word for moon is uh, Hilsha and our word for uh, a rabbit cottontail rabbit is Hilsha and that's my presentation let me uh, Quit my sharing here if I can do that. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. This is uh, just wonderful. And I, I bet we have a few, we have time for a few questions. Uh, Rebecca, uh, if you could check on the uh, chat session and uh, and pick out a couple questions, maybe Mike can Michael can go ahead and answer a couple of those. Well, we had a nice long discussion in the chat. Um, the, the main question Frederick had is, why doesn't anyone restore the sites that were destroyed or altered? Um, I don't know. I, um, the Cal's Mountain, um, we know the approximate area where it's at. Um, um, I, you, I guess you don't really have to have the, the, the site restored. Uh, I mean, it's still just, it's still a sacred, the, um, the sacredness doesn't come from what people have done to it, but from where, where it's at and what its alignment is. So, um, I've been on Cal's mountain at the, at the solstice. Um, um, I guess there may be some, somebody may want to do that at some point in time. I had one question come in through email. What is the importance of Kumeyaay cosmology in the management of natural resources and the conservation of a landscape? Oh, that's a big <laughs> question. Uh, but well, you know, I, I talked a little about that, that, how it was integrated in with the way you harvest, when you harvest, when you burn. Um, you know, all of those things were part of our um, of our our land management. Uh, you know, it, it was it was all integrated in in uh, as one thing. So it was really uh, throughout there. The the landscapes, it you know, I, I think there there are places it, that kind of crosses over to present day when we're looking at um, at view sheds and the cultural landscapes and and we may be looking. You know, if there is a an important um, uh, observatory site, it, you know, if some kind of development's going in that's going to block the view of, of where, what that observatory aligns with, then that, and then I would, I would think that would be a, a significant impact to, to that site. Um, so, you know, I, I, so I, I think they're, uh, you know, getting, getting more into the, into the modern sense, I think there are a lot of, a lot of cases where we, where we can have some some impacts that um, I don't know, you know, a long time ago, if if um, if people would have um, uh, how they would have taken some of that. I, I think the um, understanding the the harmony of the cycles and the balance of forces. It seems like that was really a big part of of day to day living that um, and things that were disruptive to that in whatever form they take would be something that you'd want to avoid. Diana, how many questions, more questions do you want to take? Um, let's take one more. And then I, I would like to ask one question too. Uh, Michael, um, how important is the cosmology today to your, uh, uh, you know, to, to your, uh, particular band or other bands that are here in San Diego County. Does it play as an important role as it did in the past? Does it have any role or importance right now? It, well, not as much as it did a long time ago. I mean, we're 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 governed uh, a lot more by by the modern calendar and and our um, our schedules and our work week and vacation days and whatever else we have. But we do still observe uh, different events that. 
I've been to a, a couple times to the, the solstice observances uh, over at La Rumorosa. Uh, we've had gatherings over at the spoked wheel site uh, down in Ocotillo. Um, there's even uh, uh, some of the some of the border wall um, objections that are going on right now are to to some of the visual impacts to to um, uh, Eagle Mountain. Uh, it's also called Signal Mountain out, out in the desert. So so there's uh, it is a part. We we had a Shaluk uh, ceremony down in Balboa Park uh, in 2015 over at the at the Oregon Pavilion and had a lot of singers there for for the uh, summer solstice. So it's still uh, still part of part of our lives, part of our culture nowadays. It's it's just not anywhere near as much as it was integrated into our lifestyle a long time ago. Uh, Rebecca, let's take one more question and then I'm going to uh, say that if other people have questions that they would, uh, you know, are interested in getting some answers, if you want to go ahead and send a note to Sunbelt or um, send an email, we could forward them on to uh, Michael and Michael might, you know, perhaps answer those uh, for you. Um, but uh, right now we just have time for one more question and then we'll, we'll do a closing. I'm trying to find one because I think Mike kind of answered some of the questions I did see in here. Um, oh, here's a quick one that sounds fun. Uh, I wonder if Michael has a favorite constellation. <laughs> well, Emu was Emu and and uh, and Shaluk are 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 my favorite. Uh, Emu, the three mountain sheep. Um, I, you know, I just look for it when I go out at night. Uh, I mean, you know, this time of year, it's it's a, a little bit after sunset, but not much. You know, like an hour after sunset, uh, you can see a moo coming up, and it's just so distinctive those three stars, and uh, and they just come straight up. They're vertical when they when they come up over the horizon, and and uh, um, I like it. I, I like the stories of the mountain sheep, and and uh, you know, the mountain sheep. They, they they follow the hard path. They don't follow the easy path, and they're uh, um, and they're just you know they're a, a huge animal that manages to live in some of the most desolate areas that you can imagine, and and uh, and they live and, and they they thrive you know as long as people aren't shooting them, um, and and so they're they're kind of uh, kind of a good a testament to to um, uh, to me you know the perseverance and through through adversity. Uh, Shaluk, I just like the, the tie in with the stories and I like the the, uh, the, the kind of superhero uh, shooting lightning bolts out of his bow. And and uh, I think we can uh, maybe get Marvel Comics to make a make him he can battle it out with Thor or something, you know, but <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, I just like I like those kind of stories. I always like uh, Greek mythology and 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 I like our own stories and and all of those kind of things. I, I think they um, they're just great imagination and and they have so many lessons that they incorporate within them too. Uh, lessons about life and 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 I think some you know common themes with uh, all of humanity. Thank you very much, Michael. And I wanted to mention to folks that we've had all of these great speakers, the last several speakers, because it's part of Native American Heritage Month. We've had uh, talks on the geoglyphs, on our new uh, sneak peek at our basket book, Michael today. Next week, we have Michael Wilkin, uh, who will be speaking on Kumeyaay ethnobotany. So I hope you can join us. That'll be next Thursday, also at one o'clock. And just before I close, I just want to remind you again that if you're interested in getting more details on uh, Mike Connolly's uh, book, it is available. We do have a discount for all of you that are viewing it. And um, thank you once again for joining us for a Sunbelt Spotlight. And I hope you join us next week for Mike uh, Wilkins' talk on Kumeyaay Ethnobotany. Thank you again, Mike, for joining us and, okay. and uh, see you next week. Thank you, everyone.